All right, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's always fun to talk about foodborne illness outbreaks right after lunch, and you got a nice pest management uh, presentation right before about, so we're hitting you from both sides. So what I'm gonna talk to you about today is uh, foodborne illness outbreaks in New York State. Um, the data that we have is gonna be limited. Some of you may have seen some of this data because we're all dealing with this thing called COVID. And you'll see that some of our, you know, we weren't able to update a lot of our numbers. Um, next slide, Angela. So to give you a little background, we're gonna talk about foodborne diseases. We're gonna talk about outbreak investigations and foodborne disease surveillance in New York State. I'm gonna go over some outbreak investigation examples, um, cyclosporin and scombrotoxin. And then towards the end, we'll play a little game called Guess That Pathogen. Next slide, please. So each year, roughly, there's 48 million illnesses, 128,000 hospitalizations, and 3,000 deaths that are caused by foodborne illness in the United States. Next slide, please. So the typical way that we investigate these outbreaks is we call it the three-legged stool approach. It involves more than just one program. It involves more than one department. It involves more than one agency. It involves environmental health, epidemiology, and laboratory. Each office performs something a little bit different. However, some of them may perform more than one thing. So you're gonna see our environmental health staff, they may be interviewing people, they may be running statistics, and usually our epidemiology staff does that as well. But we look at things at evaluating food service establishments, we review food procedures, we conduct staff interviews, collect food environmental samples, and implement some interventions. On our epidemiology side, develop questionnaires, look at the statistics, collect stool specimens. And then our laboratory side used to focus a lot on PFGE analysis. Now we're using what's called whole genome sequencing. Next slide, please. So the main thing there too is communication is key. We wanna make sure that everyone is communicating with each other. So on the next slide, we talk about what is the definition of an outbreak. So technically the definition of an outbreak is defined as the occurrence of two or more illnesses resulting from the ingestion of a common food in the United States. Back in 1992, there was three exceptions to this definition. We used to have a single case. If you had a single case of a toxin in intoxication or a chemical intoxication, such as botulism or something from a chemical, it was considered an outbreak at that time, but that definition changed in 1992, so we need two or more cases. Next slide, please. This gives you a little bit of breakdown on how outbreaks are investigated in New York State. And there's two typical types of outbreaks that we see. What we refer to as the complaint-driven outbreak, you'll see on the left-hand side of your screen, and what we refer to as the lab-driven outbreak is on the right-hand side. The complaint-driven outbreak is the typical outbreak we used to see where somebody calls and complains, or you had an outbreak at a wedding reception, or somebody went to a big, huge party in a gathering. The complaint goes to the local health department. The local health department will send that to the regional office. The regional office will send it to the central office, and there's this huge team that works on it. And it may involve other state partners, such as agriculture and markets, or our Department of Environmental Conservation, if we're dealing with shellfish, and our federal partners, such as the CDC, USDA, or FDA. What we've been seeing a lot now with our foodborne disease outbreaks is what we call the lab-driven side of the investigation. This is where a person gets sick, they go to their doctor, they provide a stool specimen, it gets sent to the lab, they get a positive result, it gets compared to other positive results, they run analysis using post-field gel electrophoresis, or mainly now whole genome sequencing, and now we find out that this person has, let's say, a salmonella that 20 other people in New York State had that are highly related to each other. So we wouldn't have known there was an outbreak because it wasn't a complaint, but now we have these lab cases that we need to look into closely and look into more fully to find out if there's some sort of common exposure that they had. So that's what we refer to as the lab-driven investigation. Next slide, please. So now we're gonna talk about foodborne disease surveillance in New York State from 1980 to 2018, and we're gonna go over the data that we've collected over those years. Next slide, please. So here you'll see our number of foodborne disease outbreaks ranging from you know, numerous outbreaks that we saw in the early 80s, hundreds and hundreds of outbreaks, 
to we had about 60 foodborne disease outbreaks in 2018. Now, we use the same definition so that these were all on the same level. So even though a single case may have been considered an outbreak um, prior to 1992, we use the same definition for this slide. Now, in the next slide, you're gonna see these little arrows pop up regarding some of the significant years. So here, one of the significant things we saw is we saw a huge drop in 1993. So what could have happened there? Why did that happen? So I mentioned that the definition of the outbreak changed, but we kept that same definition for all these numbers for every year. So one of the other big changes that happened in 1992 was that's when New York State instituted the prohibition of bare hand contact with ready to eat foods. You'll see uh, another arrow pop up around 2003. So some of you may have seen me present this and I apologize for you hearing this again, but that was the year I started in a food protection. So we had a big reduction in that year. The next arrow that pops up you're gonna see is 2009, um, which shows another significant drop in foodborne disease outbreak. So in 2009, um, we had about 38 foodborne disease outbreaks reported when the years prior we had 53, 53 and 84. So the significant thing that happened in 2009 was H1N1. That's when we were de dealing with the, the flu pandemic that basically a lot of resources were being spent on the flu pandemic and people were mistaking their foodborne disease illness for, oh, I've got the flu. And we didn't see a lot of outbreaks reported during that time period. And we are seeing that happen now with COVID. Um, so what's happening with COVID right now is, you know, we've got very few outbreaks that reported to us in 2020. The 2019 outbreaks, we cannot close out um, because, you know, of the COVID situation that we're currently facing. We're waiting for lab reports and other reports coming back from our local health departments. However, 2019 was also a low year because, you know, that was a kind of the start of the COVID situation that we were dealing with. Next slide, please. So this slide shows you the top 10 foodborne disease outbreaks by agent for New York State from 2004 to 2018. Here you're going to see the number one agent is the unknown agent. Um, basically what that means is we weren't able to identify through stool specimens or through food specimens or food samples what actually caused that outbreak. There are a number of investigations that we have where people may not want to participate or they got sick and they're better now. And by the time we find out about it, they don't want to provide us their poop in a cup, let's say. Um, but that's, you know, one of the things that's tough with dealing with all these investigations. So that's why a lot of our outbreaks are, have an unknown agent. However, for the agents that we do know about, the majority of our foodborne outbreaks have been caused by norovirus. Um, the second most common agent is salmonella. And the third is scombrotoxin. We see a lot of scombrotoxin in our metropolitan area region down in the New York City area. And that's one thing too to mention that these, this outbreak data does include New York City foodborne disease outbreaks. And the scombrotoxin, you know, we see it often and it's often out of the control of the consumer. There's not much they can do with it. They can't cook it out. It happens. Sometimes it does happen with issues from the consumer or from a restaurant where they're not storing the tuna properly and it's decomposing in the scombrotoxin is showing up. Next slide, please. Here you'll see foodborne disease outbreaks by etiology for the same time period. So you'll see a majority of our outbreaks that we've seen were bacterial as well as unknown. And then viral was the third most common in this category. And we talked about what the unknown is. The next slide kind of shows you a different view of this same information, just basically in a, in a line diagram. And you'll see that our bacterial outbreaks, um, you know, tend to be increasing. And this, a lot of this could be due to our better technology that we're seeing with the use of whole genome sequencing, with the use of, you know, post gel freezes, we're identifying more outbreaks that are occurring. Next slide, please. Here you'll see just what we saw in the most recent year back in 2018 the number of foodborne outbreaks with the known etiology. Salmonella was the most common one that was identified in 2018, followed by norovirus and scombrotoxin. Again, our salmonella outbreaks, a lot of those have to do with multi-state outbreaks where there's more than one state involved 
We're also seeing a number of different foods coming in that are ready to eat that are contaminated. You can notice that with a lot of the recalls that are happening. Um, and we're picking up a lot of our lab results and our whole genome sequencing data that identifies that our cases are associated with those types of products. The next slide, please. This slide here shows you basically the top 10 contributing factors identified in foodborne disease outbreaks in New York State from 2014 to 2018. So what we mean by contributing factor is what was done that contributed to the outbreak. So basically why the outbreak occurred. A majority of them are associated with contaminated ingredients. That's, those are the products that come in contaminated already. You could have more than one contributing factor. So let's say for an example, you had a, a ground beef outbreak. Well, if it came in contaminated already, you had a contaminated ingredient, but it's normally a food that is served cooked. However, if there is an adequate cooking that took place, now you have two contributing factors to that outbreak. You have a contaminated ingredient coming in contaminated already, and it was followed by inadequate cooking, which a person then consumed and got sick and developed illness. A large number of our outbreaks are also associated with the infected person because the infected person likes to add a little bit of their own special ingredient into the food. And that's when we have the workers that are working while they're sick, or some of them may not be working while they're sick and don't even know they're sick because there are particular viruses like norovirus you can shed prior to being symptomatic. One of the things we find out in our, in our investigation is that a number of workers will say that they never had symptoms at all However, they were positive for norovirus. So we've seen a large number of, let's say, um, reported asymptomatic food workers that later show up positive for norovirus. It could be they may not be telling us the truth. It could be they were actually asymptomatic, but it's, a, it's been very common lately. One of the other things you'll see here um, is hand contact with implicated food. That's the fourth bar up from the bottom. So basically, when you have an infected food handler if they handle the food item with their bare hands, it's captured in that 39 as well as in that 130. So basically 39 of the contributing factors identified during this time period were associated with an infected food handler that used their bare hand contact. However, there are some outbreaks where we identify an infected person, but we don't really identify whether or not they use bare hands. So that's where that those other number comes from because basically those people may have handled the food, but we don't know if it was their bare hands, if it was their gloved hands. We don't have enough data to say what it was, but we know that they were infected. So that's why those two numbers there are a little bit different. Next slide, please. So specific contributing factors that we've seen in bacterial outbreaks, you'll see here in this range from 2004 to 2018, there's several different contributing factors. The reason why is because bacterial outbreaks are often associated with a number of different food items, a number of different processes, a number of different handling methods that could take place. So you'll see majority of our outbreaks were associated with, you know, contaminated ingredient. A number of them were associated with inadequate cooking. We saw some cooling issues. We saw some cross-contamination issues, some preparation several hours before service, allowing those bacterial pathogens to proliferate in the investigation or proliferate during the process where the food was being held improperly. Next slide, please. On this next slide here, you're gonna see specific contributing factors that are identified in viral outbreaks. And you'll see there's a smaller number of categories associated with these. A number of our viral outbreaks are mainly associated by the infected person. We also see the hand contact with the implicated food, and at sometimes we see contaminant ingredients. So this is the type of information that we use to train our investigators out there, that if you know you're dealing with a viral outbreak, these are the kind of things you wanna look for. You wanna look and see if they have an effective food handler. You wanna look and see if they have a food worker policy or an ill food handler policy. If they're using gloves, if they're using their bare hands, how are they handling the food? We basically wanna, find out that information. There are some viral outbreaks that we do have that are associated with products coming in contaminated already. Those could be our shellfish outbreaks that may be contaminated with a viral pathogen. 
are hepatitis outbreaks that may be associated with frozen berries that we've seen in the, in the previous years. Those types of outbreaks could be viral outbreaks associated with a contaminated ingredient. Next slide, please. Here you'll see the top 10 significant ingredients in our foodborne disease outbreaks. There are times where we can't identify that specific ingredient. However, we do have enough information to identify that it was a foodborne outbreak. So that's why you'll see the large number there where there's no specific ingredient. Fin fish has been the most common significant ingredient associated with our outbreak. And those are mostly associated with scombrotoxin. We often see ciguatera toxin as well, but mainly scombrotoxin are the outbreaks that we see associated with fin fish. Um, followed by poultry, beef. Our poultry outbreaks, we do see a lot of Campylobacter, we see some salmonella, our beef outbreaks, we see several different pathogens, our E. coli. There's starchy foods, fruits. Fruits are often associated with, you know, a contaminant ingredient coming in already contaminated. There's not much we can do about it there. The other fruits that come in um, that may get handled by an infected worker, we often see those with our viral outbreaks as well. Um, green leafy vegetables we've seen with both bacterial and viral outbreaks. Next slide, please. Oh, the method of preparation identified in foodborne disease outbreaks. You'll see here that a majority of our outbreaks have been associated with cooked serve foods. Those are foods that are cooked and then served right away, such as your ground beef, um, your other quick foods that are cooked and served right away. Foods eaten raw or lightly cooked. Those are often our shellfish outbreaks. Um, some of our salad outbreaks are involved with salads with raw ingredients. Salad masks of potentially hazardous foods are some of our big beef type outbreaks where you may have a, a meatloaf that are associated with, with an outbreak. Multiple foods you'll see here is also another category. What we tend to find is a lot of our outbreaks of multiple foods are associated with an affected food handler. Why is that? Because the infected food handler may have handled more than one food item at the time and may have contaminated more than one food item at the time. Therefore, we've got more than one food contaminated and it's, it's often hard to identify those, but when we're seeing statistical significance pop up for more than one food and you do a food prep review and find out that ill food worker handles more than one food and these were the foods, it kind of puts a nice dot to your eye and cross to your T. Next slide, please. All right, so now we're gonna go over just some examples of some multi-state outbreak investigations that happened recently in 2019. And the next slide, you're gonna see a list of selected foodborne outbreak investigations that have been identified from the CDC. And Angela, if you give it another click, You'll see an arrow pop up here. So one of the ones that I want to talk about is the fresh basil from Siga Logistics of uh, Morales, Mexico. That was a cyclospore outbreak that we dealt in in 2019. There are other several outbreaks in here. One of our state and agriculture markets was heavily involved in was this Carowind brand tahini. Um, the deli slates, meats and cheeses we were involved in. See the frozen raw tuna we were involved in. Um, I believe there's a lot of these romaine lettuce we were involved in. Um, there are several listeria monocytogenes. We were also involved in the North Pole fork bison outbreak uh, back in 2019. So I'm going to talk about two of these outbreaks. One of them is going to be, you'll see here on the next slide, is the outbreak of cyclospore infections linked to fresh basil. And the other outbreak I'm going to talk about is an investigation of a scombotoxin fish poisoning associated with yellowfin eye tuna. Um, Angela, could you, yep, and one more slide, Angela, thank you. So the cyclospore outbreak that was associated with fresh basil was an interesting outbreak. So it involved 241 confirmed cases as of September 27, 2019. Exposures occurred in five states, Florida, Minnesota, New York, Ohio, and Wisconsin. On onset dates ranging from June 10, 2019 to July 26, 2019. There were six people hospitalized that were associated with this outbreak. There were zero deaths. And epidemiologic evidence and product distribution information, information indicated fresh basil exported by Single Logistics of Morales, Mexico, was the likely source of this outbreak. 
So how did New York State get involved? Well, back in mid-June, we had 11 cases in New York State. A lot of them were clustered around three particular restaurants that we were seeing. So when we looked at the information from those three restaurants, we found out that they had the same produce supplier. And agriculture markets um, helped us a lot with this investigation and trying to get through that produce supplier, you know, where did their product come from? In New York State, we ended up with 132 cases in New York State and approximately 12 events in New York State. So we had 12 different subclusters across our state at, at little restaurants that all received product from this one produce supplier. What was interesting about the produce supplier is there's not much the produce supplier could do. This was fresh basil. So it comes in, they, I don't believe they repackage it or anything like that. They, you know, unbox it and they distribute it. But it came in contaminated with obviously without their knowledge and the restaurants were using it contaminated without their knowledge. Some of the interesting things is one of the things that made trace back was that the invoices provided by this supplier that was going to the restaurant said the product was of country A, but really it came from country B being, you know, Mexico. So what happened was that this supplier used products that mainly came in from two different countries. The majority of it came from country A. So country A showed up on the invoices, but that, not, that wasn't necessarily what was given to these restaurants. What we found out was that they were actually given basil from Mexico and not that other country that was listed on the, on the invoice that they may have had. So that was another thing that was interesting was we had one incident where I had interns working on this investigation and one of the small clusters of associated restaurants, but they ate pizza. And so the interns were asking me, and this is a great, you know, learning experience for them was, well, the pizza's cooked. So how did the pizza get them sick? So one of the things I tried coaching them into is, well, you have to find out how was that pizza made? Meaning when was the basil added? And sure enough, the basil was added after a cook step. So the pizza came out of the oven, they sprinkled some fresh basil on it to give it a nice look, a nice taste, and it gave the people a little bit of cyclospora as well. Next slide, please. Oh, I got a misspelling here. So I got sombrotoxin. It looks like it should be scombrotoxin. Sorry about that. So this was a scombrotoxin assorted with a yellowfin ahi tuna. So this was interesting. And what else is interesting is you didn't see this on the CDC list that I showed you earlier. What's interesting we found out with scombrotoxin is, um, you know, as Angela mentioned, I'm the NORS, the National Outbreak Reporting Site Administrator for our state. So I kind of was seeing an increase in scombrotoxin cases, basically scombrotoxin outbreaks in New York City at this time. So there was about in 2018, we saw one outbreak in New York City with two persons sick. Between August 1st and September 30th of 2019, that short little time period, we saw five outbreaks in New York City of scombrotoxin with 13 cases. This is a huge increase from 2018. So I reached out to our Food and Drug Administration, our state agriculture markets and CDC, and sure enough, there was something going on across the state with tuna and scombrotoxin across the country and other states were also seeing a similar issue but with cdc it's a different group that follows up on the scombrotoxin they don't normally usually report this stuff to NORS, so that's why this doesn't show up on the cdc's website as a multi-state outbreak because it's a different group that focused on that however fda our partners at fda was heavily involved in this investigation and i worked with fda and tried to get a final report out there and we're able to put together a final report involving the multiple states that were involved. So on a multi-state level, there was 50 illnesses and one hospitalization with zero death. The last illness onset was November 24th, 2019. And there's several different states involved here. You'll see um, Delaware, Massachusetts, Maryland, Minnesota, New Jersey, New York, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Rhode Island, Vermont, and West Virginia all had cases associated with this outbreak and it was mainly associated with consumption of a tuna product. Next slide, please. All right, so now we're just gonna play a little game called Guess That Pathogen. 
So the two outbreaks that we just talked about, cyclosporin and scombrotoxin, are a little bit different than our typical salmonella, than our typical campylobacter outbreak, than our typically e. coli outbreak. So now we're going to talk about some, some outbreaks that happened of a little unusual circumstances. Next slide, please. And this one may need a few clicks, Angela. Yep. So back in July of 2008, there was a report of six adult family members that were admitted to a hospital emergency department. So basically, the ambulance showed up, rushed these people to the hospital, rushed them to the emergency, and you'll see that three of them were male and three of them were female. Next slide, please. So the six family members shared a meal of homemade stew and bread. Another family member arrived one hour later and found six family members laughing, confused, hallucinating, dizziness, thirsty, and vomiting. So this is how they found the six family members. To me, that's like one hell of a party that family member missed. But we'll go to the next slide. So we had six people that were sick. Three were male, three were female. Age ranged from 38 to 80 years with a median of 42 years. The incubation period was about less than one hour. When you have these short incubation periods, you're normally thinking it's something that might be toxin mediated. Symptoms involved laughing, confused, hallucinating, dizziness, thirsty, vomiting. And then at the emergency department, two out of six were unconscious. Four out of six had altered mental status. Five out of six had tachycardia and dilated, and they were sluggishly reactive pupils that they had as well. Temperatures ranged from 98 degrees Fahrenheit to 99.4 degrees Fahrenheit. Respirations ranged from 17 to 22 breaths per minute. And they, we weren't able to identify, or you know, the investigators at this time weren't able to review the food preparation at that time. Next slide, please. So during the next six hours in the emergency department, six patients continued to experience tachycardia, medriasis, and altered mental status. One out of six was unconscious. Five out of six demonstrated confusion, aggression, agitation, disorganized speech, incoherence, and hallucinations. Six out of six were admitted to the hospital. Five out of six were placed in intensive care. Next slide, please. So what did they eat? So when we looked at the food history, apparently these people ate a stew. And in this stew was potatoes, garlic, onion, tomato, curry powder, and leaves from two plants grown in the yard. Um, if you could hit the arrow down, Angela, you'll see a picture pop up. One of the plants that was in this stew was mint, and the other was this item right here. They didn't know what the plant was, but it was growing in their, in their yard and was growing wild, and they thought, oh, this will taste good in my stew, and sure enough, it had an effect likely. So what got them sick is the, is the next slide. So was it A, scombrotoxin, B, ciguateratoxin, C, anticholinergic poisoning, or was it D, my wife's cooking? So I'll let you guys go ahead and take a second and just pop some answer choices in the chat and we'll, we'll, uh, we'll go over this all at the end because we have a few more to go through. Okay, I'm seeing a couple of responses there. I don't know why nobody thinks it was D. So we'll, we'll go to the next slide. So what got them sick? And if you give another tab, it was the anticholinergic poisoning. And this was an actual investigation um, that was performed by the state of Maryland back in 2008. And here I'll give you, if you want more details on it, there's a link here to the CDC MMWR. So it's anticholinergic poisoning that actually got these people sick. All right, we'll go to the next one, please. So this was an example, and this was an actual example in May of 2012. It was a Taiwan National Buddhist birthday celebration. It's normally celebrated the second Sunday of May. Approximately 700 people attended. And there's about 500 people that arrived in multiple chartered buses. Several people also arrived using personal vehicles. 
So they had this little get together, the Buddhist birthday celebration. And the next slide, please. Well, then people decided, okay, after this, hey, let's all go shopping. So if you do another click, you'll see buses that travel to a big, huge shopping center in New York. And one more click. Apparently, people on those buses were vomiting. And they were vomiting, you know, some of them, the buses had to pull over, but some of them didn't get sick until they were at the shopping center itself. And you had a number of people that were at a National Buddha's birthday celebration showing up at a shopper center and numerous of them were vomiting in the next slide. Well, this is who shows up at the shopping center. You had the sheriff, you had police, you had ambulances, you had the Department of Homeland Security showed up because they felt this may have been some sort of terroristic event that was happening because they had these hundreds of shoppers that, that showed up a number of them by buses and were getting sick at the shopping center. Next slide, please. So what happened at the monastery? Well, it was a food festival that was held over 15 vendors. They were not licensed food vendors. The vending booths reportedly were set up in parking lots. Food was transported in cars from hundreds of miles. There was no temperature control. It was a very small kitchen at the monastery. Food was not reheated properly. Ill people vomited on the bus at the shopping center and pulled over on the side of the road. Next slide, please. So we ended up with 56 cases that were interviewed, 56 reported vomiting, 20 reported diarrhea. Incubation period ranged from one to two hours. Approximately 40 attendees went to an emergency department. And what they found out was that sticky rice had a relative risk of 6.47 meaning that if you ate the sticky rice, you were 6.47 times likely to get sick if you did not eat the sticky rice. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned, there is no food samples left. So if you do another click, this picture will show up because our actual investigators had to go dumpster diving. They went into the dumpsters to find leftover food samples. There's 11 food items collected. There is five primary specimens obtained, four fecal, one vomitous. All 11 of the food items collected were all positive for a certain pathogen. So what got these people sick? Was it, in the next slide, was it salmonella? Was it staphylococcus enterotoxin? Was it scombrotoxin? Or was it D, my wife's cooking? I see a couple of couple of bees there. Okay, so if we go to the next slide, it was actually, you know, you're correct. It was actually Staphylococcus enterotoxin. We were able to isolate it from the stool specimens and from the food specimens. So you can go on to the next one, Angela. That's fine. So then, in this next example here that we have um, was back from May of 2002. Emergency room personnel were called to a household. There is five adults of Middle Eastern descent that were there, 60% male, 40% were female. Age range was 29 to 60 with a median of 43 and symptoms included dizziness, lightheadedness, cyanosis, vomiting, and there was one female that was unresponsive. One asymptomatic male did not eat the meal. Next slide, please. So the ambulance showed up, picked them up, brought them right over in the next slide. You'll see that they took them to the hospital En route to the hospital, two women had respiratory distress, loss of consciousness, and they were intubated. One woman had seizures. All five were cyanotic and had oxygen saturation levels of 72% to 96%. And the blood drawn for routine testing was described as black colored. Next slide, please. So the implicated meal consisted of meat, rice, and vegetables. Meat was purchased on May 15, 2002 from a national discount food warehouse. Meat was boiled in water, a white crystalline substance from a plastic bag labeled refined iodized table salt, and both English and Arabic was added. Herbs were added to the water, which was subsequently used to make the rice and vegetables and the herbs. The product labeled salt as salt, spices from the kitchen, and samples of the remaining uncooked meat were submitted to the lab for testing. So what do we think got these people sick in the next slide? Was it E. coli? 
B, Campylobacter, C, sodium nitrate poisoning, or D, my wife's cooking? So I'm seeing a few C's there. So let's go to the next slide and we'll get our answer. It was actually C, it was sodium nitrate poisoning. And if you give one more quick, Angela, there's gonna be a picture of this, um, or actually one more, I'm sorry, this bagged product that shows up. So what happened was these, this family moved into this uh, new apartment here and they found this bagged product which says sea salt labeled in Arabic, but apparently it wasn't sea salt. The person that owned the apartment before did a lot of canning and they had sodium nitrate that they used for canning and, and meat preservation and the family used this product and this is what happened. Here's the link to the MMWR as well if, you, if you're interested. All right, next example, please. So example number four, November of 2016, 24 people attended Thanksgiving dinner. Four people developed coughing while eating. 75% were male, 25% were female, age range 25 to 55 with a median of 40. Two out of four coughed up a feather. So what caused this? Was it A, my wife's cooking, B, my wife's cooking, C, my wife's cooking, D, my wife's cooking, or was it E, my wife better not see this presentation. So I hate to say, but this was actually a true story. And my brother brought home this nice fresh turkey for my wife to cook for Thanksgiving. And sure enough, it had some feathers that were still partially left in it. So she tried plucking them as well, but some of us ended up with a feather. Uh, but uh, <clears throat> I don't know what the true answer is to that one because uh, tomorrow we're celebrating 10 years of our uh, marriage together. And I guess you better not see this presentation, right? Don't eat the turkey. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I think we've got a few minutes left for questions. Um, the next couple of slides are just by uh, acknowledgments to thank, you know, some of our state and federal partners as well, um, and some of the information that we got in our New York Integrated Food Safety Centers of Excellence. And then the last slide has my contact information. If you guys want to reach out to me after this, you are more than welcome to. And hopefully you guys enjoyed the presentation, and I'll take any questions we have with the remaining time. Let me see. Bill, you were helping me with questions. What percentage of investigations come from complaints versus lab results? An actual percentage, I don't know, but a majority of them are still from complaints. Um, there are several complaints that come in that lead to investigations that don't necessarily lead to outbreaks. So there are several complaints because we get thousands of complaints every year that come in where they get investigated, but they may not technically be an outbreak. Um, so, but a majority of our outbreaks still are the complaint driven ones that we've been seeing. However, you'll see a lot of our multi-state outbreaks and our laboratory outbreaks are, uh, we'll see that are some lab oriented outbreaks as well. So David, since the, we all know that COVID was, is not foodborne illness um, connected at all, is, where did you get your most updated information from? Was it from Cornell, the CDC, FDA? Who, who gave you the most updated info on that? On, on COVID, that it's not food related or? Yeah, yes. Like when so, I mean, it, get called on that. So I'm just curious as to who, where did you start getting your most current info from? I mean, it's a lot of our info comes from um, our, our federal partners and a lot of it comes from AFTO, the Association of Food and Drug Officials. So I know mm -hmm. AFTO was heavily involved in some earlier presentations as well as, you know, with our CDC and FDA partners looking at COVID as not really being a uh, a pathogen that's transmitted through food, and we know it's a respiratory illness, but you know our public doesn't seem to understand that all the time. So we'll get some sort of complaints thinking they got COVID from eating from a, from a food, um, but you know really when you do the contact tracing, you find out that no, their COVID is from you know the person that they were with, um, mm -hmm. you know, four or five days ago. 
What is interesting, though, is what we, we have seen, and I've had two outbreaks this year reported to us, which looked like they were chemical contamination outbreaks from restaurants that overuse sanitizer because everybody was getting prepared for, you know, what, you know, reopening their restaurant and what to do and they're all scared of COVID. And we've got two outbreaks where people ended up with, you know, vomiting and a chemical taste in their mouth. And basically the establishment overused um, a strong concentration of sanitizer and likely contaminated the food um, from the, you know, the food being in contact with food contact services. So, I mean, that's something else. I don't know of how many, you know, I'm sure other states may have seen this as well, but we did see a couple examples of that happen this year. 